continue our series in this book of Romans and we're in chapter 10 and we're going to read together from the fifth verse of chapter 10 to the end of verse 11. The title for our message uh, this evening is Legal Righteousness and Believing Righteousness Contrasted. Legal and Believing Righteousness Contrasted. We read from verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And so reads God's precious word uh, to us. Well, we looked at verses 1 to 4 last Lord's Day evening, and it really, um, verses 5 to 11, are really an extension or an explanation of the, the fourth verse. Um, and, of course, it's, it's also just a continuation of a number of verses previous to that as well. It's a clarification, if you like. It's a, it's a simple statement, again, of the gospel as it is contrasted to the, uh, as we call it, legal righteousness, as Paul refers to it in Philippians 3. Well, in these particular verses, we have a great contrast between these two different types <coughs> of righteousness as we said the first is legal in verse 5 and the second is a believing or a righteousness of faith uh, as it's seen in verses 6 to 11. Calvin says to render it evident evident how much at variance is the righteousness of faith and that of works he now compares them for by comparison the opposition between contrary things appears more clear. And that's so true in every aspect of life. If you want to see something that's um, to really show the difference, you show the opposite things to really emphasize the difference. And that's exactly what Paul is doing here. He emphasizes legal righteousness in the fifth verse, and then in verses 6 to 11, he talks about this righteousness of faith or believing righteousness as uh, we have referred to it. We have uh, six points. One point dealing with legal righteousness, which is its problem or the problem of legal righteousness. Then we will be looking at the priority, the place, the promise, the process, and the pledge of believing righteousness. And I will repeat those headings as we go through. First of all, the problem of legal righteousness. Verse 5, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. And the real problem here is in the phrase, the man which doeth those things. The problem is we cannot do those things. That's the problem. Yes, it is true that if we do, and to some degree, and even as believers, this has an application, as we obey the law of God, there is blessing and there is a a growth in sanctification by them. But the problem for us all is, is that we cannot perfectly uh, perform legal righteousness. We see the the real difficulty if we look back to the verse 
where this is found in uh, Leviticus 18 and verses 14 and uh, 15. Uh, Leviticus 18. Or sorry, verses 4 and 5. Leviticus 18, verses 4 and 5. Um, which reads, Ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. And again, that emphasizes more the, the difficulties, doesn't it? Because uh, the idea here is, is actually performing, actually doing them. And there is a sense in which the law is given and there is two ways of salvation. And we have the two ways here. There is legal righteousness and the righteousness of faith. And if somebody was able to keep the law, which, is, which they are obviously unable by nature. In fact, their nature is in itself a breaking of, of legal righteousness. Mm -hmm. But if it were theoretically possible for someone to keep perfectly the law that would be a way of salvation, but nobody can keep it. We see it also in Ezekiel 20 and three verses in that prophecy of Ezekiel. Um, first of all, in verse 11, Ezekiel 20 and verse 11. And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. The end of verse 13. They despised my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. So here we see in, in verse 13 here, just halfway down verse 13, it's not even that the people were trying their best. Nobody really tries their best, even in a fallen state, although Paul, uh, we might uh, set apart as one exception <laughs> to that. But the norm is that people don't even try their best. In fact, we see here in verse 13, they despise the judgments of God. Verse 21, they walked not in my statutes, neither kept my judgments to do them, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. There wasn't even the real attempt among the nation of Israel to keep the law of God in this sense. We see it also uh, in Luke uh, 10, verses 25 to 28. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 28. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him or tested him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. And again, from one perspective, that is true. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, you will have eternal life. But it is absolutely impossible for us to do that. In Galatians 3, you needn't turn there, just quote the verse. In Galatians 3, verse 10, we read, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And as we said even on, uh, I think, Thursday evening when we were discussing this, that so often uh, we, we go with the wrong argument to religious people who think they can be saved by the law. The argument that Paul uh, brings them, and James brings them in, in James 2.10, is that it's not good enough just to keep some of it or most of it. You must keep all of it perfectly. That's the apostolic argument. It's not coming to them and say, oh no, it's not by the works of the law. You just simply need to believe in Jesus. That's not what they did. They said, if these people want to be justified by the law, we'll show how difficult it's what Christ did in Luke 10. 
It's what Paul does in Galatians 3, and it's what James does in James 2. So I would suggest to you, it is the wrong method, biblically, to try and convince a legalist that the way for him to be saved is simply to believe in Jesus alone. That is the truth, of course. That is the gospel. But what he needs to be confronted with is the impossibility of his scheme of salvation. That's what he needs to be faced with. He needs to be shown biblically that he cannot do it. And it's only when he comes to realize that, that he will see his need for Christ and for Christ alone. In fact, and I know this by experience over the years, when you go to um, a religious person who's trusting in their own works and simply tell them that they need to believe in Christ alone for their salvation, they despise that message. And, And they say that. And it has no challenge to them. What will challenge them by God's grace is when they are shown the impossibility of their gospel, of their way of salvation. And that's the problem of legal righteousness. James says, if you keep the law and just break it at one point, James 2.10, you are guilty of breaking the whole law. That's the impossibility. And that's the problem of legal righteousness. And that's the argument that Christ, Paul, and James, and all the other New Testament writers use against those who believe in a legal gospel. So, that's the problem. Now we're going to go on to the contrast with believing righteousness. And first of all, we see in verses 6 and 7, the priority of believing righteousness. The priority. What's the priority of the righteousness which is of faith? But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, or in modern way of speaking, in this way. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven. This is the opposite of legal righteousness. Legal righteousness says that. Legal righteousness says, who will make it to heaven? Who will live good enough to get to heaven? But the righteousness which is of faith does not speak in that way. We know we cannot make it to heaven our way. We never speak, well, which one of us in Aaron Reformed Baptist Church will ascend into heaven? No, that's legalism. And he says in brackets, that is to bring Christ down from above. Now he's quoting here from Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 14, but he's applying it in a different way than what uh, Moses originally Moses originally was applying this to the law but now Paul is using these words and applying them to the gospel to the righteousness which is of faith which is interesting because Paul is using the words of Moses but not using them in their direct context using them and reapplying them to the gospel of faith alone in Christ alone and what he's saying is this that if I say who will ascend or who will achieve heaven is really what, what's being said here. If I say who is it that's going to be good enough to get to heaven, well then I'm bringing Christ down. That's exactly what I'm doing. Or who shall descend into the deep that is to bring up Christ again from the dead as if he had not died and had not risen. Now, as we said, these words are taken from Deuteronomy 30, verse 11 to 14. And Paul here using the imagery of Moses, which is applied to the law, and using it in applying it to the gospel. Albert Burns notes in his commentary, It is observable here that Paul does not affirm that Moses describes anywhere the righteousness by faith or the effect of the scheme of justification by faith. His object was different, to give the law and state its demands and rewards, yet though he had not formally described the plan of justification, that's Moses, the plan of justification by faith, yet he had used language which would fitly express that plan. The scheme of justification by faith is here personified as if it were living and describing its own effects and nature. Now notice here, verses 6 and 7 brings us back to the principle of verse 4. 
in our text, which verse 4 reads, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And as we said on Lord's Day evening, what that means simply is this, that Christ brings us to the place where perfect obedience to the law would have brought us. Christ achieves the end result that obedience to the law could not achieve because not the problem as excuse me as Romans 7 says not that the problem was in the law but the problem was in us in Romans 7 Paul says that the law is holy just and good the commandment is good and so on the problem was not in the law but the problem was in us. So Christ being the end of the law or the, the goal or the end result of obedience to the law in Christ we have it all. Therefore we do not need to do what has already been done by him. If we start, and Paul says this to the Galatians, if you begin... If you get circumcised, and again, the reason why they were going to be circumcised was because they thought they needed to be circumcised in order to be accepted by God. He says, if you get circumcised, you are bound to the whole law. You have fallen from grace. And that's what fallen from grace means. The legalists will tell us that falling from grace means, you know, you sin. No, that's not falling from grace. Falling from grace is seeking To be justified by the law. That is what it is to fall from grace. So if we attempt to um, do our works, it is tantamount to bring Christ out of heaven or to say he needs to rise again from the dead. Our third main point is the place of of believing righteousness in verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. What Paul is saying here is the principle is that we do not need to go anywhere to find Christ. We do not need to move any place in order to get saved. Or to be saved. It is the application of the word to our where we are. The word coming to us. The word being near us. That is what saves us. The word being in your heart is what saves your soul. It's not that we need to do something. Something needs, listen to this, something needs to happen to us. Something needs to change us. It's not that we need to perform something. There needs to be a change. The word of God needs to be applied. Remember in Acts 16. In verses 30 and 31. The Philippian jailer. Asks them. Sirs. What must I do to be saved? And Paul gives him. An answer that is not corresponding to his question. That does not correspond to his question. The jailer is asking what work must he do. Paul says it has nothing to do with what you do. It's about what you believe. And you see this is not a work. Because faith is something that impresses itself upon us. I often use the example, uh, maybe the strange example, if uh, a man that we knew was a a murderer walked into that door just now with a, a weapon in his hand, we would believe that he is going to do some damage. And that's not because we haven't done any work. We haven't done anything towards the man. We simply believe What he is going to do. And what Paul is saying to the Philippian jailer is this. You need to be convinced. That's what faith is. Faith is being convinced. That God alone. Is the one that can save you. And you see being convinced. Is not doing anything. That is something being impressed. 
on your mind. You are convinced of something. And that's what people need. They need to be convinced of something. And that's why earlier I said that people need to be um, unconvinced of their own gospel and their own way of salvation for until they're until they're rocked and and destabilized of that method of salvation, they will never see their need for Christ and Christ alone. They must be moved from that position. And that's the New Testament method. That's the method that Peter and Paul used in in Acts chapter 2. Peter does not get up and say, oh, well, we've got a new gospel, and here it is. No, he, he brings the burden of their sinful rejection of Christ upon their head, and then they are, they are stricken in their hearts, pricked in the heart, it says. What shall we do? And again, he doesn't give them anything to do. He says, believe in Christ. This is what you need. Not to do something, but to be convinced of something. And that's why the Word of God says that the, that the Scriptures are able to make us wise unto salvation. It doesn't say the Scriptures are able to show us all the stuff that we need to do. But the Scripture is able to educate us and to convince us what salvation actually is. Let me give a, an up-to-date illustration of this. In the recent elections, many people were convinced that certain political parties uh, were no longer worth voting for, so they changed their allegiance and so on. They were convinced in their mind, and therefore their actions bore that out. And what we need to be is convinced in our heart and mind regarding Christ and Christ alone. And I would say to you that if you are even here tonight and you're not convinced, that's the point where you need to be and where you need to concentrate. It's not you saying, well, I need to be a better person. Of course we do, but that will never save us. The only thing that will save us is realizing that there is nothing that I can do to save me. And that I, as Paul could say, that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Fourthly, in verse 9, the promise of believing righteousness. The promise of believing righteousness. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What is the promise? What is the promise? It is the promise of salvation. Notice the promise is made on the basis of two realities. First of all, a genuine confession of Christ. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, Him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. We must confess Christ. And again, this is not to be done as a work. This is to be the outpouring of our hearts. It's not that I say, oh, well, this is the way to get saved. I'll go and start talking to people about Christ. No, confession here is the outpouring of the soul. It is something that overflows. Like the Lord Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It's this type of confession. It is those who have been so convinced of Christ that they, they must speak of him. It's not that I'm doing it as a work to get saved. But I'm so overflowing with the greatness and with the sufficiency and supremacy of Jesus Christ that I cannot but help speak of him. That's the person who will be acknowledged before his father. In 1 John 4.15 Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Listen. God dwelleth 
in him. What John is saying, the only ones who will ever confess that Jesus is the Son of God are the very ones and only the ones that God dwells in and he also dwells in God. It's impossible. It's impossible. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 12, 3. No man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. And again, it's not a mechanical um, just saying the words. But no man can confess. The word say there is a confession. No man can truly acknowledge or confess the Lordship of Christ but by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Again, 1 John 4, the the Apostle John tells us not to be naive. Beloved, believe not every spirit. There seemed to be, in the early church, this thing of people just believing whoever came into the church. We need to give time. It's a practical thing here. Don't just open ourselves to every new person. Give time. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Time is the great test. Paul could say, you you ran so well to the Galatians. What hindered you? Some people can go on well, and it's a bit like the parable of the sower, isn't it? You know, some people, there's almost this exaggerated thing. And that's not good. When it's an exaggerated sort of um, life and, you know, beware of that. And beware of that in your own soul. We're not meant to be, you know, hop, skipping and jumping all the time. Life is meant to be difficult. The Christian life is hard. And if somebody, I'm always worried about somebody when they're giving off this impression that everything is okay. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. And that is true, especially of the preacher. He is to be tested. Because many false prophets are gone into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Again, that is not a bare acknowledgement that there was a man, Jesus Christ. That is much more than a bare acknowledgement. This is somebody who boldly confesses that God was manifest in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. And the center of his doctrine is that. That's the center of his creed. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. But secondly here in this verse, the promise is made on the basis of true and genuine faith. The promise of salvation is based secondly on the True and genuine faith, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. It's not belief that Jesus Christ died that saves us, according to Paul. It is belief that God raised him from the dead. That's what saves the soul. That God vindicated. Christ, that God declared Christ's death to be the acceptable sacrifice for sin. That's what saves the soul. That's why back in chapter 8 and verse 34, who is he that condemneth? Who can stand up against us? It is Christ that died. And notice not to diminish the death of Christ. But look what it says in verse 34. Yea, rather, or more importantly, that is risen again. Christ's death was different from every other death in that it did not end in death. It ended in life. Even all the ones who were risen from the dead with Christ, they died again. 
and will only be raised on the last day. And then the rest of chapter 8, he goes into this uh, just overflowing. I love the way Paul writes in, in this way. He just overflows with just poetic utterance of the, the assurance and the conviction that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What did the resurrection of Christ prove? We've already said that God accepted his sacrifice. But it proved according to Romans 1 and verse 4 that he was the son of God. Romans 1 verse 4 says that he was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead proves that he was that very life in fact back in John chapter 6 and interestingly enough John 666 John chapter 6 verse 66 reads from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him interesting that that's John 666 isn't it and so many go for a while oh be we need to be so aware of this. So many walk for a little time and then go no more. And we can be discouraged. But listen, this happened with Christ. So much so, in the following verse, the Lord Jesus says, will ye also go away? And there's, there's this human Sigh to the Lord Jesus in that verse, isn't it? It's like, you know, everyone else is walking. Will, will you also leave? The wonderful response of Peter. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ the son of the living God. See that's the only thing that will keep us isn't it? That is the only single truth. That will keep us. If you are doing this in your strength. If you are doing this. Because you're trying to please God. You will fail. You need to be convinced. About Jesus Christ. You need to be convinced that there, there's nowhere else you can go. That he is your life. He is everything. The Colossians probably made a worse mistake than the Galatians. The Galatians got the gospel wrong. Those of Colossi were getting Christ wrong. It's even more dangerous. Probably the only thing more dangerous than what the Galatians were doing. Both were obviously a death knell to true Christianity. Nathaniel in John 1.49 confesses, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. And Christ says, because I said I saw thee under the fig tree, you say this, I say you will see greater things. You will see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You see how important this confession. Martha says, she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And John in John 20 and verses 30 and 31 gives us the very reason for the writing of his gospel record. Many other signs truly that Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written. I have written these things that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I haven't written these things so that you might become better living people. The singular reason why I have written these things is so that you can come to one central conviction that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. 
and that believing or being convinced he might have life through his name. That is all that matters. Beloved, that is all that matters. That is not only central. That is the truth that will keep us on the Christian path and on the road to heaven when everything else departs from us. So, we have considered the priority of believing righteousness, not to interfere with the work of Christ, verses 6 and 7. The place of believing righteousness, we do not have to go anywhere, but simply be convinced in our heart. And then fourthly, the promise of believing righteousness, verse 9, salvation. Now fifthly, the process of of believing righteousness. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now the reverse. Notice earlier on the mouth was mentioned first then the heart. Here the, the right order. First of all with the heart we believe. And then with the mouth, confession is made. There must be the conviction. There must be the realization. There must be that moment. And we're not talking about the, the pump in your chest. We're talking about the mind here. There must be the moment. Always get worried when, when, when Christians make this false dichotomy between this and this. It's not what the, the, when the Bible says the heart, it's talking about the convictions. It's talking about the mind being gripped with a truth so much that, that the mind is overtaken with this truth. That's what it means. This is the heart in the Bible, not this. For with the heart, truly convinced, Truly believing, truly resting, man believeth unto righteousness. I mean, we, we live in a day of heart transplants. Does that mean you, you won't be saved anymore? No, no. It's in here. We must be convinced. And when people start to make a distinction between this and this, that's not biblical. Also, this verse proves Arminianism to be false because it says with the heart. And the Bible shows that the heart is, <laughs> Jeremiah 70 and verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. And, and the scripture says that it's with this very heart that man believes. Well, there has to be a change in the heart. Because if we believe with the heart, it has to be with a different heart than what we have by nature. There must be a change. That's why there must be regeneration before faith. I remember when <laughs> the first time I, I was, I realized that I was at a Bible study in Bray and we were talking about this and I, I just said, uh, um, it was actually Terry Price was leading the Bible study and we were talking about this and for the first time I just, I said the words and I wasn't sure if I was, if I was saying it right and I said, I said is, is it like this? It's not that we are born again because we believe, but we believe because we're born again. And I was waiting for the, you know, oh, that's heresy. And Terry looked at me and says, that's it. And I went, yes. <laughs> Inside, I didn't go yes. Outside, Inside, I went yes. And that's exactly it. We believe because we're born again, because with the heart that God gave us, the fleshy heart, as Ezekiel says, I will give them one heart, an undivided heart. Ezekiel eleven nineteen, And I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh. There is the heart transplant we all need, isn't it? And will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes. And keep mine ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. You see, God will only be the God of those who love Him. See, the sort of all the other gospels, and I don't want to be too un ungracious. 
But all the other Gospels present a God who just wants us to make, like even many evangelicals who say, well, well, God wants us to make a decision to accept Christ. No, God wants us to love him. God does not just want us to tick a box. Yes, I accept that doctrine and that doctrine. God wants to populate heaven with those who love him. Those who desire him. And that's why he must give us this new heart. This heart that loves him. This new mind. This new mind that wants to obey. That wants to be with him. As David could say, when shall I see God? David could say, even in that barren, dry, sandy place. That he thirsted for one thing. And that was God. That's only fulfilled. Not in David but in Christ. And we have received. According to Romans. The mind. Of Christ. God has changed our minds. From being his avowed enemies. Into his. Loving servants. Job could say, though he slay me, yet shall I trust in him. That is a safe soul. Finally, the pledge of believing righteousness. Verse 11. For the scripture saith in God, that's why we're saying pledge, it's similar to promise. But we're saying pledge because of the way the verse says it, for the scripture say, God has inscripturated this promise. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. If you're going to die in 60 seconds, there it is. That's what you need to hold on to. Whosoever trusteth on him shall not be ashamed or confounded. As Peter says, I think that's the Septuagint rendering. It's one or the other. One's the Hebrew, one's the Hebrew is ashamed, or, or vice versa. This brings us back to the last verse of chapter 9, doesn't it? Verse 33 As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed taken from Isaiah 28 16 and every time you doubt your salvation it has to come back to this do I believe God's pledge do I believe God's promise if I truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ if I believe in my heart and in my mind that God has raised him from the dead, well then do I accept and believe God's promise that I shall be saved. Fanny Crosby wrote those wonderful words. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit washed in his blood this is my story this is my song praising my saviour all the day long it is that relationship with Christ that is all our confidence all our assurance all our hope let us read those words again as we close Romans 10 verses 5 to 11. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. The man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep. That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? 
the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Amen. Let us sing the, the, the word of God in closing in Psalm 45. The second version on page 86, Psalm 45. And we'll sing... Verses 1 to 3, my heart inditing is good matter in a song. I speak the things that I have made, which to the king belong. My tongue shall be as quick his honour to indite, as is the pen of any scribe that useth fast to write. Thou art fairest of all men, grace in thy lips doth flow, and therefore blessings evermore on thee, on Christ doth God bestow. And verse 3, we're, we're praying that Christ will go forth in mighty conquering power. Thy sword geared on thy, th- on thy thigh, thou, art, thou, art, thou that art most of might, appear in dreadful majesty and in thy glory bright. And that's our prayer for this land, for this nation, that Christ would come with his sword of truth, with his word and he would smite his enemies so that either they would be driven away or brought to their knees to him in confessing his name and believing in their hearts that he is the son of God. Let's stand to sing verses 1 to 3. Catherine, can you start this for us? is good matter in a song I speak the things that I have made which to the king belong which to the king belong my tongue shall be quick his honor to indite as is the pen of any scribe that useth fast to write that useth fast to write the fairest of all of might appear in dreadful majesty and in thy glory bright and in thy glory bright O Lord we we worship the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. We pray, Lord, that this day and every day of our lives, that you would graciously feed us with this manna from heaven. Feed us with the bread of heaven, which is Christ Jesus. Give us evermore this bread, not the bread of the earth, but feed us with Christ day by day, moment by moment. O Lord, 
bless and pity us even this night. That we might be those who will confess him. That those who will be a blessing to our families, to our friends, to our neighbors, to all those who know us. Oh, deliver us, Lord, from being ashamed of Christ. Deliver us from that sin, we pray. And make us bold witnesses of the King of glory. Make our tongue ready and able to write and to speak of his glories, of his excellencies. We give thee thanks for those things that we shall receive. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Amen.